Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for blessing us with that special music. Um, thank you for allowing us to welcome you as part of the Willowdale Church family. And if you're here this morning and you are a guest and you are looking for a church, we would gladly welcome you to be a part of this church family here at Willowdale. I wanted to begin by <clears throat> sharing with you something that I shared with first service. Basically, it's just, it, it kind of makes me chuckle. I think this microphone's a little too hot, isn't it? it? There we go. Ah, good. I tend to get a little loud, so I'm just preparing you ahead of time. Um, I love technology. I use technology every day, and 99.9% .9 of the time it works. But there is that 0.1% of the time it doesn't. And it just so happens that every time I have to prepare a sermon or preach the next day, it fails me. And I don't know what it is, but I was on the phone with a lady, a very nice lady from India yesterday, trying to fix my computer. Nothing worked. It was, it's unbelievable how every time I have to preach, something happens to this computer. It is quite astonishing. But I am here. I came by this morning to tell you that God is good. And I am still going to preach to you this morning. I may not have all the slides I had before because I lost them all, but I'm still going to show you some pictures by the grace of God. What do you say? Amen. So I want to tell you that when I was growing up, I really, really didn't like something going, when I was going to school. And that is pop quizzes, tests in general. I really don't like them. Um, I understand if you're a teacher why you give tests to students, but I just had this sinking feeling in my gut. Every time the teacher said, okay, pop quiz time, clear your desk, I look around the room, I see all the teachers saying, yeah, okay. Uh, I didn't like that. And I don't know if you were like me, but what's interesting is that the scripture reading that we read today, the portion of scripture that we're going to dive into this morning is about a time when it seemed like Jesus was performing a pop quiz on his closest followers, on the disciples. Could very well be the very first pop quiz recorded. And since we're talking about the theme of pop quizzes, I wanted to begin this morning by performing a pop quiz with you here this morning. It is a four-question quiz conducted by a company, a Swiss company called Anderson Consulting International. It is a questionnaire, so to speak, and, uh, that they would use in their interviews to see how well you fare as a professional in their company. Don't worry, the questions are not that difficult. There is a first big hint. I will ask, though, um, how many of you got right? First service, we actually found one person who got three out of the four questions right. Very rare. I've never met a single person that got all four questions right, but we'll see this morning. If you were here first service, don't say anything, or if you know about this quiz, don't say anything to anyone. Just watch as they writhe in agony, try to figure this out. Okay, it's not that difficult. Kids actually get this a lot easier than adults. Here's question number one that they would ask in an interview. How do you put a giraffe inside a refrigerator. I'm going to let you think about that. We can't feel the responses because of, you know, I didn't want to, you know, just think about it. Just think about it and see if you're correct. I'm going to give you the correct answer in just a second. What a question to ask, right? What's your name? Robert. We're glad you're here. Listen, tell me, how would you put a giraffe in, an, in a refrigerator? How would you do that? Okay. Got an answer? Somewhat? You'll catch on as this goes on. Okay, here's the correct answer to that question. You open the refrigerator. You put in the giraffe. And you close the door. This is an actual question. The reason, the reason why they ask this question in an interview is to see whether you tend to do simple things in an overly complicated way. Fair, okay. Let's move on to question number two. Question number two, let's see if you catch on. How do you put an elephant inside of a refrigerator? Okay, I hear some of your responses. 
right? Open the door, put in the elephant, and close the door. If you thought that, if that was your answer, you would be absolutely wrong. <laughs> the correct answer is you open the refrigerator door. You take out the giraffe. <laughs> you put in the elephant. And then you close the door. The reason they ask you this question is to see is to test your ability to think through the repercussions of your previous actions. Number three. Let's see if you're, you're catching on. The Lion King is hosting an animal conference, and all of the animals attend except for one. Which animal doesn't attend the animal conference? Why isn't the elephant there? He's in the refrigerator. You put him there. Congratulations. You figured that one out. Great. This will test your memory. Last question. Here's your chance. One more chance to prove your abilities to be a professional. Okay, number four. There is a river that you get to that you must cross. There is a sign beside the river that says, Danger, Crocodiles. It is a crocodile-infested stream. You have to get to the other side. However, there's no bridge. You can't swing across. And what was the other thing? I can't remember. But anyway, no boat. That's right. It was no boat. How do you get from one side of the river to the other? Turn to your neighbors. Just tell them if you, if you think you got it right. Your last chance. Are you fit to be a professional? Okay. I'm about to tell you the correct answer. See if you got it right. I heard a lot of different responses. And this is the answer. The correct answer is you jump into the river and you swim across. Why? Why are there no crocodiles in the stream? Where are they? No, they're not in the river. They're at the animal conference the Lion King called. <laughs> Folks, the reason why Anderson Consulting asks this company is to test whether you learn quickly from your mistakes. <laughs> now, how many of you got at least one question right out of the four? Oh, lots of you. Okay. How many of you got two questions right? A little fewer. Three questions right? Whoa, we have some young people. Okay, okay, we have about four or five people. How many of you got four questions right without knowing this quiz ahead of time? Oh, okay, nobody, all the hands went down. <laughs> okay, this quiz is just for fun. It's just, it doesn't really matter if you got them right or wrong. I, I guess unless you were, Pastor, did you get any of them right? I always try to stump him with these kind of questions, but he's so quick. He always knows the answers. That I, I hope I stumped you this morning. So this isn't, doesn't really count. Unless you're applying to get a job at Anderson Consulting or maybe a job at Google, they like to ask these really out-of-the-box kind of questions to see how you think. If you can put one into or think outside the box in some, in some interesting way. What's interesting is that the question that Jesus asked that we read for a scripture reading is not just for fun. The question that Jesus asked his disciples was a very serious question. And just as it was serious back then, it is just as serious for you and me today. Let's jump into our Bibles, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. We're jumping right into our text this morning, Matthew 16, verse 13. I usually put the scriptures on the, on the screen. That looks really yellow. Uh, I usually put them up, but because I lost my slides, I will allow you to use your electronic devices or your Bibles. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It begins by saying, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples have been following Jesus around now for about three years. They have seen the miracles. 
They have learned from him. He taught them everything he knows. And now this is the only time in in the New Testament where we have a record of Jesus, a Jew, walking in a place called, mentioned by name, Caesarea Philippi. Have you ever stopped to ask the question, why? Why is this there? Obviously, God wants me to know something. And what's with the place? Why did Jesus go to that place? Did it have any sort of historical significance. We're about to find that out this morning. Here is a couple of pictures I did manage to salvage. Here is a, um, a map that I just got from Google Maps. I don't know what happened to that screen. That just went yellow just between first service and second service. I, we apologize for that. But up here, you can see my, my pointer. That's where Caesarea Philippi is. About 25 kilometers away is Nazareth. This is the place where Jesus grew up. So this is the distance he's walking, 25 kilometers. Jerusalem is down here. That's the capital, the holy city. That's 120 kilometers. Can you imagine walking 120 kilometers by foot? Jesus knows he is three years into his ministry. He knows he's about to be crucified in Jerusalem. He is making his way down to Jerusalem to be crucified. And he knows that. Now, Caesarea Philippi was back then what we would call today a resort town, kind of like a Cancun in Mexico or Dominican Republic. I have a picture here of what it looks like. Wow, that's very different. If you want to see a clear picture, look at that one. That's very clear. So here we have a place that was just luscious. It had lots of pools because of springs that came up from the ground. It was a place where uh, there was vegetation because, well, of these, the water that fed the vegetation. Down, it wasn't like the south where it was all deserty and kind of, uh, kind of dead. Mount Hermon was just off in the distance. So this was at the foot of Mount Hermon. And so the, the sun, when it came out, would melt the snow on the top of Mount Hermon. And streams of water would flow down the mountain and well up in these underwater springs. Well, one of those springs came out right here in Caesarea Philippi. This spring is very significant. It is the beginning of the Jordan River. If you ever wondered where does the Jordan River start, you know that famous, very, uh, very important river to the Jews especially and to the Christians, where does it start from? Right here. This is where the Jordan River starts from. And now, uh, funny enough, this wasn't a city that people really lived in. People came to visit, but not very many people actually lived in Caesarea Philippi. Now, one thing that you would never, ever see in Caesarea Philippi was a Jew. You would never see a Jew there. Why? Because Caesarea Philippi was known for its pagan worship, big time. Let me show you some pictures. Here are some pictures of what it looks like today and what it looked like before, an artistic uh, rendering. That rock right there, the city pretty much butts up against this rock, which is called the, the Rock of the Gods. They called it this because it was a rock with a lot of these little uh, holes kind of dug out. And in each one of those little niches was a god that people came to worship. Gods like Pan. Pan was this Greek mythological half-man, half-goat type of thing. And and he was here. You have a big temple of Caesar. You have all these other little gods, depending on how important it was, how big the niche was. There's a big one, though. There's a big one. You might see it. It's right here. It's that big cave opening. That is a very significant place. That is where the the Jordan River actually comes up. That place right there is called the Gates of Hades. That is what the Bible refers to as hell, or what the people at that time referred to as hell. People used to bring sacrifices to this place. They used to take their sacrifice, walk up to the edge where you could go in, and then there was a big drop-off. They would throw in the sacrifice and wait to see if blood came out of the water on the other side. And depending on that, they would know if their sacrifice was accepted or not. A place that was fully steeped in pantheism 
and, and the worship of, of multiple gods and, 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 and the worship of Baal. They actually thought that that cave opening was the entrance that ba- Baal used to enter the underworld. Just so you start to imagine the kind of place what we're talking about here. All of these shrines. If I had to compare it to today, it would be kind of like, like Sin City. What's Sin City? Las Vegas, Right? I don't know if you've ever been there. I've never been to Las Vegas. I don't know what it's like. I heard it's interesting, depending on where you go. But I think that this place, I've heard, I've read that this place is even worse than Las Vegas. In fact, there is something that really keeps Jews away from this place, not just the worship of these gods. And that is, that remember the first king, I'm taking you back to the Old Testament now, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, his name is Jeroboam. He led the people of Israel into idolatry. And guess where he took them? Right here. This place is incredibly significant. And a Jew would never go there. Do you start to see the tension? Do you start to see Jesus walking there with a bunch of his Jewish friends? I bet you they stood, stood out like a sore thumb. I bet you that when the disciples walked into that place, they had goosebumps. Because I don't think any Jew had ever stepped into that place between or around that time when all of these pagan gods were starting to worship, being worshipped. A place of such natural beauty, but a place of such spiritual darkness. And Jesus deliberately chooses this place as a backdrop, a place where the world religions are on display in their full glory. He chooses this place to ask the question, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? What an interesting place to ask a question. Key point number one, if you're taking notes, jot this down, Jesus is your Savior. In fact, when I found out about this place, I found out about it when I was studying at Andrews, when I started digging a little more and starting to figure out, wait a minute, what? When I started figuring out, I mean, G- the fact that Jesus was there was huge for me. And, and I, I'll tell you why. I was a little uncomfortable thinking that Jesus walked into a place like this It made me a little uncomfortable. And then I learned an interesting and a great truth. That Jesus is not afraid to go anywhere. Psalms 23 verse 4, you know it very well. I'm going to repeat it in in the the King James Version just because it sounds more uh, kind of poetic. Psalms chapter 23 verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Just because you have done those things, just because you have been in those places that you should not have been, Jesus can always rescue you. No matter where you go, no matter what you've done, he is never afraid to come and rescue you out of those places. You will never be in a place where God can't reach you, ever. Verse 14, jump with me down one verse. Their response says, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It's interesting to kind of hear what the public opinion was about Jesus. I mean, all of these people were great. John the Baptist, preacher of repentance. So was Jesus. Elijah, a man, a prophet, known to be a man of prayer. So was Jesus. He stayed up many times all night to pray. And then you have someone like Jeremiah. Jeremiah was also known as the weeping prophet. Jesus, many times in his ministry, was found absolutely sobbing, weeping. All of these are good, and all of these are close, but none of them hit the mark. All of them miss it by just a little bit. I remember when I missed the mark once. It was my senior year in high school. I was on the soccer team. I loved playing soccer. And um, it was game day, one of our final games. 
And it was a home game, so usually you dress up in a nice suit, a tie, the days that you're playing, and the team, the rival team, came to our school. We played them on the side field at GCI in Cambridge. I remember I was, do, I was playing in the right midfield position, and the team that we were playing were very good. I mean, they were just hammering us, trying different ways, trying to get that goal, trying to get that goal, until one time they made a mistake. They made a mistake... And we got the ball, and immediately, what we were told by our coach was, as soon as you get that ball, pass it to the two forwards. Our two forwards were extremely good strikers. They were fast, and they worked together very well. So what did we do? The defense passed it up to them. And of course, everybody knew that they were good, so they all flocked them. And everybody left me open. All right, all right. <laughs> take a jog up the field on the right side. And as I was running, they're just going in between everybody, getting close to the goal. And as they approached the goal, they took a shot, a very hard shot at that goal. And they shot, but the goalie saved it. He didn't just save it. He actually just deflected it away from the net. And guess where the ball ended up? Right at my feet. I had one job to do. Kick the ball. There is nothing standing in my way. It's a wide open net. And I kicked that ball, and it wasn't even close. I mean, I'd like to tell you that it was like an inch away from the ball. It was not even, I don't know where that ball went. We never found it again. God only knows where that ball ended up, but I wasn't even close. Now, I want you to listen to some of these quotes of people who were very close about saying who Jesus was yet just a little bit off. Listen to this. Mahatma Gandhi, he says, I cannot say that Jesus was uniquely divine. He was just as much God as Krishna, Rama, or Muhammad, or Zoroaster. So close, right? He says, he, he said, God is divine. I accept it. But he is not uniquely divine. Listen to what Oprah Winfrey says. She says this, One of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to what you call God. Whoa. <laughs> Al Mohler kind, of uh, kind of elaborates on this new religion, this new age kind of uh, philosophy and religion that um, Oprah Winfrey is into. Listen to what he says. He says, Oprah's newly packaged positive thinking spirituality is tailor-made for the empty souls of our postmodern age. She is filling a need that the postmodern generation is craving for. And then he, goes, he says this, listen very carefully, she promises meaning without truth. She offers meaning without truth. She offers acceptance without judgment. Now that can actually be a good thing, right? We all want to be accepted without being judged. That's a good thing. Last thing, she offers fulfillment without self-denial. So close, but a little bit off. It's interesting that you can speak of Jesus today as a prophet. You can say he's a teacher. You can say he's a spiritual leader, and nobody will object. Very few will, if any. As soon as you say Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that He is in equal nature with the Father, that He is God in bodily form, you will have so many people lining up to debate you on that, and so many Facebook comments, you won't know what to do with it. Today, a billion Muslims will say, prophet, yes, God, no. Jews around the world today say, teacher, yes, Messiah, no. Liberal Protestants will say, Exceptional man, yes. Divine, no. Jesus was created by God, in a sense. And I, while we did the At the Foot of the Cross series, I actually brought out a magazine because I think it was very, very significant. People are really confused nowadays. What is truth? Where do we find it? And I found this, um, this April edition of Time magazine in the United States when I was traveling there. You see what's on the cover? Is truth dead. I thought that was very interesting, kind of talking about the fake news and Trump. I pretty much, you, you can guess what it is. But here's key point number two. 
Jesus is the truth. John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the what? Truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We will never find the right answer to the question, who is Jesus, by taking a public poll. We will never find the right answer to that question. I often hear people say, well, all religions are basically the same. They all lead you to the same God. I disagree. Christianity is exclusive. Listen to this quote. Look at this. Acts 4 verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. In no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given unto mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is very unique. Jesus is your Savior and Jesus is truth. Let's read the final three verses. Verses 15, 16, and 17 says... But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. What did it really mean for someone like Peter to actually utter these words? I think it was very difficult. I think it was difficult. I think he's a Jew. He grew up reciting the Shema. God is one. It was completely out of the realm of possibility to call a human being standing in front of you God. They were all expecting this Messiah to come in and rule, and he wasn't. So he's having some cognitive dissonance. That's a big word for saying confusion. He was, it didn't make any sense. How can this man be the son of God? But yet he saw the miracles. He saw the compassion. He saw the way Jesus taught. And he said, something's different with this man. He probably wasn't as popular with his friends anymore after coming to that conclusion and uttering that with his mouth. So what does that mean for us today? You know what? Sometimes when we get to know Jesus, he can turn our world upside down very quickly. There are people that need to unlearn traditions and things that they have grown up knowing for a long time when they get to know Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ never leaves you the way he found you. He wants you to grow. It also means that, you know, knowing Christ, knowing God for who he is, as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as a Savior, as truth, won't make you very popular at school. It won't make you very popular at work or among your friends. We are doing a series right now on the Reformation. And today's topic is Solus Christus. Martin Luther, a monk, began to discover for himself who Jesus Christ is. And he started to realize, I don't need a Roman system to give me access to my Savior. I have direct access to him. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is truth. And look what happened to him. The moment he started standing up for what he believed in was the moment they tried to kill him. You may not be popular by holding to a biblical view of who Jesus is. But here's the good news. Jesus knew that. He says in Mar- uh, John 16, he says, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. See what he's saying? He didn't say that you're going to be rid of all your issues and all your problems. He says, regardless of your problems, you will have peace. Do you have peace? Amen. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. That's an amazing promise. So just how important is this question for us today? Desire of Ages, page 412. Ellen White says this, phenomenal quote. The truth that Peter had confessed is the foundation of the believer's faith. It is that which Christ himself has declared to be eternal life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Key point number three, our last one, Jesus is the King. Revelation chapter 22 verse 12 says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give it to each person according to what they have done. Jesus is coming very soon. But before he comes, every person in this sanctuary, every one of our relatives, every one of our friends, every person that we have ever come in contact with must first answer this very important question. Who is Jesus Christ? Do you have an answer to that question? What is your answer to that question? Here are some quick ways in the meantime before Jesus comes to get to know Jesus for yourself. These are pretty obvious. Number one, pray and ask God for himself to, re to reveal himself to you. This week, make it a mission. God, I'm going to pray that you reveal yourself to me. See what happens. Number two, read the Bible. Christ is contained in those scriptures. Have you found him? Amen. Number three, come and fellowship with fellow believers. That we're, that's what we're doing this morning. That's what we do during this uh, few weeks that we have a series with Pastor Carlton Rolston. We have a series right here. Come on out tonight at 7 o'clock. Just listen to some of the things that are being said. Maybe something that is said will spark something in you. I heard something last night that blew me away. I never thought of forgiveness that way before. You never know what truths Jesus will reveal to you by coming and listening to the Word of God. Amen. I want to finish with a video, but before I get to that video, um, I want to read to you a quote, and this quote just blew me away. When I read this, I thought, wow, this is powerful. And not necessarily the quote, because the quote itself is powerful, but knowing who, it, who wrote it is even more powerful. Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte writes this, and I believe that close to the end of his life when he wrote this, I believe Jesus was starting to make himself known even to this man. No matter who you are, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong path, Jesus will meet you there. Listen to this quote. The Jews tried to keep Christ contained within their law while the Greeks sought to turn him into a philosophy. The Romans made of him an empire, the Europeans reduced him to a culture, and the Americans have made a business of him. He says, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Napoleon is saying this. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison, he says. Wow. Wow. He says, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this very hour, millions of men would die for him. This is coming from Emperor Napoleon. Someone I would have never thought would ever know who Jesus is. Jesus is your Savior. Amen. Jesus is truth. Amen. And Jesus is King. Amen. My prayer is that you may know Him for yourself as the Savior of your life. And that truth that you may know in Him would one day set you free. That you may have peace regardless of the situations that you are going through in this life. And God knows how much peace we need right now in the world. Amen. And I want to encourage you with the fact that Jesus is king and that he is coming soon. I want to see all of you in heaven one day. Amen. But first, we must answer that question. Who is Jesus Christ to me? The video I want to show you as I close, a video that I found a long time ago. It's very moving. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can search for it. It's just called That's My King. It's uh, part of a sermon that S.M. Lockridge uh, preached. He was a preacher in the United States between 1953 and 1993. Some of you were around when he was around. 
powerful preacher. And he had this run in one of his sermons that just blew me away. I mean, if you asked him, who is Jesus Christ to you? This is what he said. And I want to leave it with you. I want you to just meditate on the words. Uh, May it inspire you as you dig deep to know who Jesus Christ is for yourselves.